Who's your least favorite member of the band? Oh, I don't know if I could say that one. Can we just make sure to open the podcast with that question? Right, right. That's going to be on the promo. (laughs) It'll be me Uh, asking the question and then you saying, oh, well, and then it'll cut off and it'll be like, you have to listen to find (laughs) out. Great teaser. Hello and welcome to WNC Original Music Episode 112, the International Emergency Episode. Very happy to have this week uh, from the band Hustle Souls, Billy Litz and Jonathan Taylor. Hustle Souls have a new album out this week called Daydream Motel. It's a really fantastic album. It's an EP actually, but uh, it's got a lot of songs on it. Some would call it an album. Technically, all EPs are albums, uh, so if you'd like to discuss that more, make sure to subscribe to my other podcast called Useless Pedantry. You can find Hustle Souls at hustlesouls.com. Also, make sure to search for their new album. Again, that name is Daydream Motel, and it's available at all the streaming sites and also at hustlesouls.bandcamp.com. Lots of fun talking to Billy and Jonathan. The guys were nice enough to send some tracks from the EP, and you're going to hear some of those right now. Here is Hustle Souls.
So Built to Change, I may have even played Built to Change for you on on the podcast. I think so, yeah. It's pretty rare for me to have a song that I can perform solo and also perform with a band. It almost never happens, honestly. Like, it's either one or the other. But Built to Change, I I put in the solo set, and it also became a staple in the Hustle Soul set as well. Um, So that's pretty unique with it. and I think you can hear that there's a slight tint of, of a more rootsy Americana vibe with it than some of our other stuff, which is more soul and funk oriented. Um, and I think that comes from, you know, it's hybrid between my solo stuff and, and the band. Um, lyrically, the song is about, let's make sure I don't conflict with what I said in my solo thing and say it's right. about the uh, that, but it, it will uh, be fact checked. Yeah, I will be fact checked by all the all the people out there who who are keeping track of this for the records uh, and the Smithsonian. Um, That's right. But it is lyrically, it's about it's about friends from the from the past and a naive naivety naivety night night. What's the word I'm looking for? Naivete. Yeah. Naivete. I think that's it. I'll, I'm not even joking. Take, I think it's naivete. Uh, that's that's not a good word, but I'll, I'll trust you that it's the, <laughs> the correct pronunciation. Uh, that naivete. Uh, I don't like it. The naivety. Uh, all right. I got the the innocence of youth and the naive naivety of it, and the coming to terms with age and things that change. Um, And there's a love story that runs through it, which is like the one rock and foundation that does not change with time um, as everything else around the main character does change. I looked it up. It's it's naiveness. Naiveness? Wait, let me try it. I actually way prefer naiveness to naivete. Oh, man. Hold on a second. I got to get this where you can hear it. Naivete. 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 So are you also like a uh, English scholar? No, that's the only word I know. That's the only word. <laughs> okay. Also, I mean, not to be a smart ass, but that's French, not English. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so, good at French roots, I right. guess. But. Yeah, yeah. You guys have been performing this uh for a while then with the uh with the band and uh Jonathan, do you do you have anything you uh, remarkable about it or you just want to talk about it as, as far as performing it and your your party or recording it i mean it's always been a fun song to play um you know it's very rootsy kind of american rock and like uh trying to figure out how to interact with like the rest of the band has always been interesting like it's not super super straightforward like four on the floor like snare drum um so it takes a lot of like push and pull with the band to like sound fluid Sound like a good song, Jonathan. How long? How long have you been with the band? So I've probably been with the band for about uh, two years now. Um, I moved up to Asheville, North Carolina. I think like the end of uh, 2017, beginning of 2018. Uh, and you know, we've been playing pretty much ever since I got up here. Just met at like the local jams around uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And you know, it's been a good time. We've been on the road a lot. Um, it's been interesting uh, lately with, you know, coronavirus coming through, you know, we would normally be on the road for three or four days a week. And now, uh, you know, we've got maybe three or four gigs a year, you know, on the books. So, you know, it's been interesting. It's been a challenge. Um, but you know, the music's a lot of fun. Uh, all the, uh, members of the band are really, you know, friendly and nice and, you know, just about making music.
Hollow is one of the songs that I think we've had the most fun playing live, which is somewhat counterintuitive because it's by far the slowest song on the album. And it's it's hard to work in slow songs into a set where, you know, we're showing up in a city where usually, unfortunately, most of the people have never heard of us before, have never heard our music. So you kind of got to hit them over the head with with the with the bangers and the fast stuff and the fun stuff right off right off the gate to try to rope people in but hollow for some reason uh has been able to connect with people right away even as a slow song um you know it's a slow six eight groove and but you know we're all over the place with the timing with it but it leads to this like epic guitar solo and i start spazzing out and screaming at the end of it and uh it's a lot of fun to play live we've actually seen some people like shed tears and stuff for it and we've we were able to play it at uh some fans of ours and good friends of ours they they got married uh over the summer and we got to play it for them uh as their first dance and uh you know that's a that's a huge honor so you know a, you know some people have made connections to the song and it just feels good to it feels good for me to let loose and just like scream on top of a wailing guitar solo with no limitations, you know, um, it's a very empowering thing. It's kind of like ecstatic dance for my, my voice. Yeah. It's, um, really powerful, like sensitive, like ballad at the beginning. And then, you know, by the end of the song, uh, we're all, you know, whenever we play it live, we're all like all over the place, just like letting loose and really is like really cathartic, uh, experience and like really, Feels good. Feels good to yeah. play a song where you get to just like let like the motion out, and you know sometimes you turn up a little bit, you play a little bit louder than you should, um, but I think it connects to people. Jonathan, I have an idea I want to run by you. So you're the first bass player yeah. I've talked to since I thought of this idea. I think, um, okay. I think uh, sometimes a bass player should also have a bass drum because it sounds so good sometimes when the bass, you know, uh, like the bass drum and the bass. Or he didn't say, so what if you just had an extra bass drum? So once in a while, if you want to just accentuate something, the, the drummer still gets his bass drum. He does, you know, he does his thing, but also you have a little bass drum. And when you want to like really pop something, you just hit your bass drum notes at the same time that you, you play your bass part. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. I, I, I always love playing on the drums whenever I can. Uh, I've been practicing a lot at home personally, just playing on drums. Uh, we actually, have like kind of a side project that we don't really play with that much anymore. But for a while um, uh, we were playing like kind of like folk Americana songs and like old jazz songs uh, where I'd be playing the bass and I actually had, you know, bass drum. Oh. I was playing with the right foot, like oh. a hi hat or a tambourine. So I, I didn't think of that then. I, I probably just, you probably no, mentioned that idea. somewhere and I read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but you know, it's great when you can, be in control of the entire rhythm section. And sometimes like the drummer needs a little bit of a prod too. Uh, so great idea. Okay. I totally so drums being played by bass players yeah. all around the U S and well, the world. Um, I think I'm a little familiar with that. You guys, uh, that was like about a year or so ago or a little year and a half or so ago. What was the name of that project? We were going by the name tall teller yeah, for that yeah. project. And we had just started like getting a couple gigs going, um, but then we had some work to do with Hustle Souls and the and the lineup change, and that ended up taking up all of our extra rehearsal time. Yeah. Uh, and you know, by the time that stabilized, and we were we would have theoretically been ready to get a side project going again. COVID came, and you know, yeah. and the rest history from there. Yeah. So, but. Someday, someday it's going to be, someday. it's going to be a thing again. Maybe if I was a little bit bolder, maybe you would let me in. If I could just get a little bit closer, maybe you would hear me then. And if you knew the thoughts I thought in whisper. Maybe you would understand if I could just to keep myself together. Maybe I would have a chance. Maybe if I sang a little bit sweeter, this melody would land and I could string the right words together to finally stop making sense if I could. Myself together, maybe 
bald Maybe you would let me in If I could just get a little bit closer Maybe you would hear me then And if you know the thoughts I thought and whisper Maybe you would understand If I could just keep my shit together Just want to say hello. I was really proud of that song for a strange reason is that when I write, and this is a songwriting, or well, I don't know if it's a songwriting podcast, but it's yeah. in some ways it is it's original music. So, it, yeah. you know, it, yeah, it's it, a song, right? Yeah I, yeah. I think you can call it a songwriting podcast. Um, <laughs> yeah. I never write songs that. Well, I don't know if it's about just, you know, what category, what, how, how far are we going <laughs> to subdivide the categories of podcasts? Exactly. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's also but, a um, unsolved mystery podcast, but mostly songwriting. The mystery of what the hell am I going to actually say when I get right. a sentence out? Right. Um, so I was I was proud of myself for that song because my general songwriting approach, I start with a cool idea for a verse, and then it's what what changes for the bridge, and then what changes for the chorus. And I've literally, and I've written hundreds of songs maybe up close to two or 300 songs. And I've never written a song that does the same chord progression the whole time. Um, you know, I'll write, I've written many three chord country songs mm. where I switch the order up for the chorus. It's the same chords all the time, but in just want to stay low, we do the same exact chord progression the whole time. And that's a music nerdy thing that nobody will care about. Yeah. Should care about. But for me, it was a, it was a nice, I pat myself on the back of like it came together and it sounds like a full song and we, we don't go all over the map. It just, it starts, it builds, it climaxes and then, uh, and then it, it moves on. And I repeated the same three chords the whole time. So I was proud of myself for that. That's a good way to make sure you don't forget the chords. And I, it honestly makes a lot of things much more difficult in the in the end, because if the chord progression tells you a lot of information, mm -hmm. it's really obvious what you should do here. You know, the drummer mm -hmm. should get bigger here and the bass player should hit this note here when it's the same thing the whole time. And all that changes is the vocal melody. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on the band arrangement to make it interesting mm -hmm. without relying on the, the chords to just do the work for you. So oh, yeah. we actually, as... I was really excited about it because I was like, look, I wrote this really simple song. We can learn this in a day. We can be gigging it by this weekend. And it ended up taking us like three months to actually, at mm. least three months, to get a version of it that we felt like was actually finished. Mm. So kind of counterintuitive, but the simpler it is, sometimes the more difficult it actually is to make sound good. Speaking, Kind of speaking of that, where, uh, where did you record the album? So we did it. Uh, Ryan Earnhardt is an engineer and he runs a studio and he has a really popular YouTube channel, Creative Sound Lab, where he, he demonstrates a lot of recording gear and recording techniques. And he's got a big following worldwide. And he's based in Canton. And you would never know that there's a recording studio there where he is. But we went out to Canton, North Carolina where he is he's got a small studio and it's mostly he does he does a lot of video work there for youtube he does a lot of demonstration um but he partners a lot with our producer eric mixerman seraphin and they work together on this project they filmed the the recording process while we were in the middle of it and we didn't really pay attention to it you know they set up cameras he always has cameras set up there they hit record and just let it run but they filmed the process and later went back and just actually released online you can pay i think it's only like 18 dollars, but you you can watch the recording and the mixing process and uh our producer is a is a somewhat well-known uh mixing educator he writes books uh under the the name mixer man so people can can sign up for the course and and hear why he made choices on the mix and uh and how he did it and then 
There is also an element where the whoever purchases the course gets access to the raw tracks to our recording session so they can do a mix themselves and compare it to uh, Mixer Man's mix. And so that's why we use that studio because we have a relationship with Ryan and Eric and we were able to give them some material for them to use on in their other world yeah. while we got to make an album for our world. That's a cool idea. So will these, um, like if somebody does that, will that be available somewhere? If, if, if you like, you might put up, Hey, listen to this different mix of this song, that sort of thing. So we, they're not supposed to release it commercially, but you know, right. I said the worst case scenario, they put it out and we get rich and famous right. off of it. But, right. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, uh, because you know, we just want people to listen to the, to the music. But, um, as of now they're, they are, there's not a place where you can listen to other people's mixes, but I'm, they just they just released the course in the past like two weeks. So oh, yeah. I'm gonna check in with with Ryan and Eric in in about a month and see if they have any mixes that are are worth listening to. I'm gonna do I'm gonna sign up for it so I can mix. I'm gonna do a dance mix and incorporate parts of the podcast interview. There you yeah. make it would be like all yeah. kinds of integration. Like. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. taking the third level. And uh, Eric uh, Seraphin, he does. He also does a lot of. Uh, he, like you said, he, he writes books, but he does uh, presentations, a lot of teaching on on production, too, right? Yeah. So he was a he was a producer and an engineer and a mixer in L.A. for a long time, working mm-hmm. for major labels, lots of bands that you know, Ben Harper and Bare Naked Ladies, and all kinds of all kinds of bands, um, and he got really well known early. Like this is like early blog days on the internet before. I don't even know if blogs were really like a common word at the Mm -hmm. time. Um, And he started to release the daily adventures of mixer man, which was a satire fictional story about the recording process at a mate with a major label studio in LA and it went viral before things went viral and he got lots of readers on there and has since published a bunch of books on uh, Zen and the art of mixing. And recently, um, man, I got to think of the name of it. Um, I usually keep a copy of it over here. Um, survival guide. Yeah. The musician's survival guide to a killer record is his most recent book. But uh, they're really amazing. I mean, it's, he's a he's a funny writer. He's mm-hmm. a very accessible writer, and it's you know, it's some of the most nerdy, dry content in the world. Talking about how to EQ a bass drum and phasing issues and stuff. It's science and physics, and it's not fun. But he he <laughs> turns it into a funny, a funny, tangible. Um, product that you can kind of you know you read the books and it it starts to bring it to life and you do understand you know why the science turns into art you know in the end and that i think that's his main goal is you know he's an artist but his books are really successful and if you're at all interested in recording as a hobbyist or a professional recordist like it's there's so much good information um especially the the survival guide to a killer record for home recording is like it's it's always sitting right next to my computer and my mixer whenever I'm doing my uh, my attempts at home recording. More from Hustle Souls in just a few moments, and I want to remind you to go download their album. That's at hustlesouls.bandcamp.com. We'll have links in the show notes for that, and also you can search Hustle Souls at Apple Music or Spotify uh, or uh, I believe on uh, just about any streaming service they also have uh, some good videos so make sure to go to hustlesouls.com but also follow them on facebook and instagram a lot of interesting videos and they uh they just did a live stream uh which is really good really well produced and uh we've got a sample video from that on the wnc original music facebook page but you can see the whole thing which is uh really cool on the hustle souls facebook page Speaking of the WNC Original Music Facebook page, go and follow that page. And also subscribe to the podcast 
WNC Original Music wherever you get your podcast. You can go to wncoriginalmusic.com and there will be links there to listen to the podcast and also uh, places, other places where you can listen to the podcast uh, on your favorite podcast player. Follow the podcast on Instagram. There's links to that in the show notes as well for upcoming uh, events, not events, just podcast episodes, uh, but also video clips and uh, pictures and stuff from the podcast. And then a whole lot of just um, irrelevant stuff that I put up there when I'm bored. Hey, this is Alex, the most important member of Modern Strangers, and you are listening to WNC Original Music.
know, Montana is a very fun, very lively kind of New Orleans feeling uh, song about, you know, woman that's no good for you, but you can't get away from. Um, really, it's one of the most fun songs to play live because it always gets a response from, you know, the audience. I think people really enjoy that song. Uh, do, you, do you sing on the uh, uh, live or on the album much, John? Yeah, I do a lot of singing live. Um a lot of the album backings are going to be me and Kevin Scott, who's the drummer of the band. Um, and, you know, we've got a little bit of uh, Eric Serafin in there, too, throwing in some vocals and some clap tracks. And then uh, Christopher Everett, who plays guitar, uh, is on there as well. Um, but, you know, live is always a challenge playing uh, bass and singing together. Uh, something I'm getting more and more comfortable with as we play more and more. We've got – John's going to be singing – if we ever get another show someday in the future, John uh, is singing lead vocals on some stuff now too. So uh, we're excited about that. We just got to find, you know, we've been working on a lot of new material since we finished recording this and uh, so that is John's and he's singing it. So I'm excited about that, but it's all in, just only in the basement right now. How large is your, uh, what's the word? Rep- repertoire? Repertoire? Let me look it up. Repertoire. <laughs> Repertoire, oh, right. yeah, repertoire. Our repertoire. How many songs do you do you have? If if I if I want to say, hey, I w- I'm having a festival, I want you to play as long as you can. How many songs can you play, and how long for how long? I mean, we can play for hours upon hours. You no know? repeats. Uh, with no repeats, yeah. I mean, we can we can crank out a four hour show easily. Um, but as we add stuff. We cut stuff, you know, so we, 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 we halfway know some of our older songs, but we're generally looking forward to new songs and keeping the few songs that, that stand the test of time. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's proven that even the songs that we love and we think are going to be the hits that last forever, they eventually, they fade away. So, you know, when we play a typical, you know, a set could be anywhere from 10 songs to, to 40 songs, depending on if you want us to play all night long at a festival. If I could say about Montana, basically, uh, it started as a riff. And I actually think, I don't know if John knows this at all. I'm just thinking of this now, is that we were hanging out a long time ago at Ledges River Park in North Asheville on the river. And I was noodling around with this idea. And it was just like a, it was just a rhythm, like in a pentatonic. I thought I had this like New Orleans vibe to it, but it was way out of my songwriting um, comfort zone. And I didn't know what to do with it or if I should do anything. It's hard for me to judge if it was good or not because it was just a riff. Um, and then I got another riff to it, but I, I was never planning on bringing it to the band at all as a song. Cause I always have a bunch of songs stockpiled and I'm choosing what to like try to, to try with the band. Um, but I was just messing around with it at a, at a rehearsal um, when in between things that we were doing and everybody was like, what's that? And we, we grooved on it for a little bit and it, it was, it turned into the song that it is like really organically and really quickly. Our songwriting process is usually an, an arranging process is really long. We can take months to like, hammer out the exact arrangement we want on a song. And I think we were performing Montana at the Asheville Music Hall like two weeks later or a week or two, a week and a half later. Um, We were were just really confident and it worked really naturally. So, yeah.
So only want some answers. We're actually, that's what we're putting out on Thursday, but I know I'm not supposed to talk about time on a podcast. Um, that's what you will have put out. That's what we will have put out on Thursday. That's the second single off of Daydream Hotel, Montana being the first. And Only Want Some Answers is one of our like more our faster, more upbeat songs. In our music, we we often like reference sixties and seventies soul music and funk music. On this one, we kind of lean into like a uh, the Bee Gees vibe. Or I was honestly thinking of uh, kind of Earth, Wind, and Fire when I first came up with the idea. So it's a bit of a disco song for the verses, and uh, it's it's a I mean it's a disco fun disco song. Can you talk a little bit about uh, just like a one paragraph uh, history of the band forming your band, not the Bee Gees? You sure you don't want my history of the Bee Gees? Yeah, yeah. I mean I just saw the movie, so I already know it. You know. Yeah. Oh, you'd already know yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just hear what what do you think happened with the Bee Gees? How do you think they started? Can you name all four of them, three of them? <laughs> I could barely pick them out of a lineup. Yeah. Especially if they're not in their costumes <laughs> uh, or in their white suits. Yeah. I know I'm not a I'm not a music historian, and I'm not a Bee Gees historian either. Yeah. I just um, was listening to a lot of Earth, Wind, and Fire at the time, and I like mm. to sing in a falsetto voice. And so the Bee Gees just that's what everybody says when they hear that song. And I get it, you know, I, I totally understand it. And we, we reference that it's, you know, it's, it's disco turning into pop music, which is coming from soul music. It's all intertwined in there, but I don't know the first thing about the Bee Gees actual history. Well, just, just give me a hustle souls history. Then I'm not good at speaking in single paragraphs, but I'll okay. try to give the, the short version. Hustle Souls, I started with Chris Everett, who's the guitar player currently. Uh, a few years back, we recorded our first like real album with a bass player and drummer who we don't have with us. Eric Serafin was our producer on that album. That was called Color, and the journey to making that album, we were basically a basement band turned into a bar band who started to do a little bit of touring and play on a couple of real stages and figure out how to be like a, you know, a concert act. Um, then we had a lineup change the past two years and have been defining our sound and centering it and working in the new personalities and new musicians into the band. And so this is kind of our reintroduction as a band with Daydream Motel um, that just shows, you know, I think we're a much more mature band. We played hundreds of more shows and figured out what, what connects with people and what we connect to a lot more on this album. Our real biography is we're a little band from Asheville, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and we try our damnedest to make good music. We used to tour on the weekends and now we just, yeah. what's the, Longest tour you've ever been on. You've been on some longer tours than weekends, right? Yeah, we've we've we used to do, you know, every every couple months we'd do two weeks or so. We'd go all the way up to Boston and Rhode Island and way up north. Um and we'd get down south too. We never did a full month or anything like that. We just don't have the infrastructure for it. Mm -hmm. And our van is way too uh uncomfortable. But <laughs> We we put in we put in two and a half weeks yeah. a couple times yeah. How do you want people to listen to your music? What's your preferred way? Spotify, where they stream it, or go to Bandcamp, download it, or you know your website or uh, CDs or what? Well, the first way would be to listen to it via WNC Original Music podcast. Yes, that is the preferred way. That's correct. But uh, after that. We we love seeing people at shows. We want them there. If you want to get a copy of the album, Bandcamp, you can download directly, and you can also order a CD so we can mail you a CD, and you can download one immediately. But if you've got Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, we're we're trying to get the music out there right now. So whatever, however you like listening to music is just all right with us. And you guys, you guys are a great uh, live band. Have you ever thought about doing a whole live album? 
I've thought about it a lot, but yeah. we've never we've never done it. I'm wondering if we should do a live album after this one. Mm -hmm. I'm not making a pledge or a promise right now, but we have a lot of new material in the works. And I don't know, maybe we missed the boat on a live album. It could be like a decade from now before we're allowed to <laughs> put on a concert again. <laughs> oh, you yeah, know, that's true. Uh, because there's an energy to a live show that, you know, you can't fake it in a live in studio, which is honestly what a lot of this album is basically live in studio. I think that there's an element to our, our sound that is that would be great. And some songs that we play all the time that we've never put out, out on a CD that would come to life on a live album. So we want to do it. And I maybe that'll be the next thing that we do. Yeah. But we got to have live shows for that to be even in, in the cards. Which way is 
a song that I think leans in toward somewhat honestly like a little bit of like of a gospel music reference in the in the keyboard part um and also like the outro we kind of lean into that that vibe musically with the harmonic progression it's kind of our, our maybe our most produced song on the album the most modern sounding song on the album we've got synth pads like under it and we we put lots of effects on the guitar where a lot of our other stuff is referencing um you know much earlier music i think that we were referencing a somewhat more modern sound on on which way we got john singing much differently on that one like if you if you ever do listen to it closely enough the uh the harmony vocals on that one to someone who knows john's voice does not sound like john he's kind of doing like a strange vocal uh contortion distortion to himself uh while while singing it and we were like oh you got to do that and lean into that and that's what we recorded and ended up uh using on on the re- recording can can I get a clip of like just that isolated vocal? Just to I'll insert it as a sample as a example right now. I can try. Nah, it's super easy. It's uh oh yeah. Time changing. Like very was it like James Bond? <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, but much yeah. better than I. But, I like the uh, face contortion that goes with the voice contortion. This there's one. no way to do a contortion like that without like it's like the guitar guitar face. Uh, people photoshopping in slugs and got John Mayer. Did you guys uh, have any musical impersonations? Eddie Vedder is not allowed because everybody does the Eddie what? Vedder impression. Yeah. I, we literally, we literally <laughs> just talked about this and we're like, dude, I don't know what we can do. And he was like, I could do Eddie Vedder. Um, uh, you can do Eddie Vedder. You can do Eddie Vedder. I'm just, I'm giving you a hard time. Ready? Ready for this? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> um, man, this is that was Eddie so... Vedder passing a kidney stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see if I can. I I could even send you a recording of this, but I've done two songs where, like, I I really wish that I wasn't myself and I wanted to be Tom Waits, and I uh, oh yeah, really. Really tried to sing like him, but so I could I could send you some of those those songs. But uh, come on up to the house. Oh, that's pretty fast. Yeah. But that's there's my Tom Waits right there. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. Come um, on up to the house. That's yeah. very good. Yeah. There you go. Well, I'd like to thank Tom Waits and uh, Billy and Jonathan from Hustle Souls for being on the podcast. Uh, make sure again to check out Hustle Souls' new albums called Daydream Motel. It's available at hustlesouls.bandcamp.com or hustlesouls.com or search for Daydream Motel or Hustle Souls wherever you get your streaming music. Also, Hustle Souls puts on a fantastic live show, and so go out and see them as soon as you can. Follow them on social media so you know when that happens. Also, their lead singer, Billy Litz, uh, is already playing live shows as Kid Billy, so find Kid Billy on Facebook and follow him there. Our closing song tonight comes from Jay Rome. He's a singer-songwriter from Jackson, Mississippi, my hometown. I chose this song especially for this episode because I feel like his vocals really match with the hustle soul feel. Uh, it's not exactly the same, you, you know. They don't sound exactly alike, but I just like the the feel of both uh, J. Rome's song and the new album from Hustle Souls. You can find more about him at callmejrome.com. You can find that address in the show notes. Here is J. Rome. Have a good week. Four hours ain't enough time to properly love you uh-uh. But as long as you're with me, it don't really matter at all uh-uh. I'll take every second just to prove I'm the one for your heart Oh, 
My mission is to give you what you need for life. Oh, oh, cause I want you forever. all over, baby, I still choose you.